In this video, we're going to cover the install process for the PC version of RetroArch. All right, it has been a hot minute since we've updated the PC guides for RetroArch, and as such, the ones that have been on the channel for the last little bit are severely out of date. But that's okay, because this is a great time to be getting back into RetroArch on PC. The latest updates have streamlined some things, and it's just... I don't know, spend some time with the program, it doesn't really feel that complicated anymore. But for anyone that's just getting started out, here is a quick help guide, I'm hoping, that will help you get started using it for your emulation projects. But as such, the PC version of RetroArch is definitely the best version. You get the power of PC processors, better video cards, and just better performance overall compared to any other device out there, depending on your hardware, of course. But let's go ahead and dive in. So to get started with RetroArch on PC, head over to RetroArch.com and go to the Download tab. And for today's tutorial, we are looking at Windows once again. So this covers Windows 7, 8, 8.1, 10, and 11. And there are a number of ways to get RetroArch now, including Steam, itch.io. But for today, we're just looking at the old classic installer method. So grab the installer for the 64-bit version of Windows. If you are still on a 32-bit OS in this day and age, I highly recommend just updating your PC because you should be running Windows Vista XP. Um, anyway, we're going to go with the installer for the 64-bit version of RetroArch this time, just to simplify things. And with that installer downloaded, just go ahead and run it. You'll probably get a UAC notification. Just hit yes when it pops up. And then we will be greeted by the RetroArch install wizard. So just proceed through the installation. And then when you get to the destination folder option, you can set the directory you want to install RetroArch to. So just go ahead and set this wherever you want to put it. It doesn't matter where it goes, just choose somewhere for it. I'm just going to leave it on default for this demonstration. Then it'll ask you to select the components to install. It's fine with just RetroArch. Then it'll ask you to do a start menu folder if you want to. I don't want a start menu folder personally, so I'm just going to tell it not to do that. But you can have one there if you want to and then it'll extract everything into the chosen directory. And after installation is finished, just go ahead and click on finish and we're done with the installer. So you can just go ahead and delete it. Woohoo! From here, we're ready to begin loading into RetroArch for the first time. So just head to the install directory where you put it. And then as you scroll down, you will see a retroarch.exe. So just click on that and it will load up the program. And then from here, if you have a controller that you'd like to be using on RetroArch, you can go ahead and get it plugged in. So, for example, here is my Power A uh, Fusion Pro 2 series controller. Gets brought right up, and I'm able to navigate the menu with it. Google Stadia controller, there is that working right out of the gate once it installed the driver on the Windows side. And then a PS5 DualSense controller also working straight out of the gate within RetroArch. A standard Xbox Series X controller. So as you can see, most things will work straight out of the gate. I'm just going to go back to my power Ray controller here. But as you can see, when you first start up RetroArch, it opens up in a windowed mode like this. So the first thing that you might want to change is to make this full screen. And this is a super simple fix. Just press F on your keyboard. And there we go. RetroArch is now in full screen and we are able to navigate the menu and everything using either our keyboard or a controller. So let's just go over the menu navigation here real quick. So there's the main menu. This is where you will load up your games, uh, load up physical disks if you're interested in such things, as well as give you access to the desktop menu, which is great for playlist organization, the online updater, information about our systems and cores, config file uh, override type stuff, and then, of course, quitting and restarting RetroArch. Then we have the settings tab. This lets us change a number of things for these various options. We'll go over these a little bit more as needed. Favorites tab, history tab. Uh, if you want to use RetroArch as a front end for your images, music, and videos, those tabs are available as well. A net play menu. And then our import content menu is for making playlists. Then we have an explore tab, which uh, will break down your games based on developer, year of release, and all kinds of other various factors. I actually don't really like the Explore tab. Like, it's a cool it's a cool thought, but it causes uh, some issues sometimes. And then new to 1.10.1 and onward is the standalone Cores tab, which we will go over more in a bit as well. But anyway, going back up to the main menu, let's dive into the setup process to get this program running how we would like it. 
Step one, go to, to the online updater. And from here, we are going to update core info files, assets, controller profiles, cheat if you want to use cheats in some of your cores, databases, overlays. Then you can download the GLSL shaders if you want to. We don't really need these, but more on that in a bit. So after you get everything downloaded in the online updater, let's head over to the settings tab here and mess around with some drivers. So we're not gonna mess with the input or controller driver, but head down to video. So by default, RetroArch uses an OpenGL driver, which is fine. But if you wanna get more performance out of RetroArch, go ahead and open this up and change it over to Vulkan. As long as you have a graphics card from the last six years, you will be able to utilize the Vulkan backend, get better performance on a number of cores. Some cores do require Vulkan. And for anything that doesn't actually support the Vulkan driver, it will roll back to OpenGL automatically. Now, if you are using an integrated Intel iGPU, Vulkan will not work for you. So you will want to leave this on OpenGL or change it over to DirectRD 12, 11, something like that. Unfortunately, those iGPUs for Intel CPUs just don't play nice with Vulkan. Next up, the audio driver. X audio should be fine. Some of you might not get audio out under X audio, so you could change it over to Direct Sound or Wasapi and see if you get audio output then. If you already are getting audio output, I just recommend leaving it on X audio. Next, let's go down to the menu driver here. So by default, RetroArch comes with this switch-like Ozone menu. Some of you might prefer the XMB or the simplistic R our GUI here. So if you want to change it, this is where you do so. I'm going to leave mine on Ozone because I hate the XMB. Next up, the video tab. There is actually quite a bit here that you can play around with if you have specific setup needs. For example, like CRT switch resolution. If you have your computer hooked up to a CRT on a separate video output line, like you can switch over to these resolutions, which is pretty great. Makes for a good arcade box, but not something you're really going to need if you're just sitting on a normal LCD, LED, OLED monitor. But let's just go ahead and skip over to the stuff we're going to need here. So first up, head into the scaling tab. And this is where you can enable integer scaling if you want to use it. So integer scaling is awesome because it makes everything scaled up by a perfect integer for the pixels. That way it reduces shimmering. The image will look a little bit cleaner but it can result in black borders around every edge of the screen, which might not be preferable to some. I personally like it and tend to use it. And a new option that has been added since my last video is to overscale the integer scaling. So this way it will scale it up another integer, but this can result in clipping on certain titles and certain cores. The severity of this will depend on the game and the core. So it's fun to mess around with. You could get rid of those black bars, but you might lose some of the top and bottom of your screen. And then the aspect ratio, leave this on core provided for the best possible experience. Or if you really want to force everything into your preferred monitor's resolution, you can do so here. Aspect ratio, rather. Next up, synchronization. Scroll down to automatic frame delay and turn this one on. This is a new option that's been added to recent builds of RetroArch, and it helps reduce input latency. You can further refine frame delay here, but for most of you, it should be fine just leaving it on zero and turning it to on. If you have a stronger computer, you could also turn on hard GPU sync. This may reduce performance, but it's a good option for those of you susceptible to input latency if you have the PC to run it. And then finally, if you are running a FreeSync or G-Sync monitor, you can enable G-Sync and FreeSync here. Now, if you are on a lower end system, you can enable threaded video. This will help give you back some performance, but will increase input latency to a degree. So if you are on a faster CPU, you could just leave this option off. Next up by linear filtering, this will blur your image, getting rid of rough pixel edges. I really do not like this option. I'd rather use a shader personally, but it's here if you want to give it a try. Then there's also video filters available here. I don't typically tend to use these ones. I prefer shaders instead but there are some options in here that are pretty interesting, but do note that these do come with a performance hit attached to them depending on the effect that you choose. Then just a quick note on controls, if you head into the input tab and head down to port one controls, you can see all the buttons that are mapped to your chosen controller. And then you could change between different input devices here if you have them selected based on the player. 
and then same thing with player two and so on and so forth. And then you could also see what your hotkeys are assigned to. So it's worth going in here and looking at what all the different hotkeys do. So quick saving and loading of states, fast forward, rewind, you can set it all right here. Now, latency tab. We've already gone over hard GPU sync, automatic frame delay, but we could also enable run ahead mode to reduce latency. Now this option will require a more powerful CPU as you are basically running two copies of the emulator to get better input latency. And then you could set the number of frames to run ahead here. The number of frames you want to run ahead is really going to be dependent on the core of the system that you're running. Not all cores support run ahead, but again, if you do not have a fast enough computer to use run ahead, this will just result in performance issues and a bad time. So. You're going to want to really test this with your games, see if it works, see if it's helpful. If not, turn it back off. Next, head down to saving. This might be of interest to some of you here. So you can have RetroArch automatically save states for you when you leave a game and then automatically load them when you start a game back up. Makes for a really streamlined experience, honestly, unless you really like seeing the main menus loading things up. You can think of it like Quick Resume on Xbox. And then you could also have it increment the save states index, so that way you will just have save states every time you exit a game. So, I mean, if you want to, like, revert back to a very, very, very previous save, like, you could turn this on and do that. And then you could set the max number of save states it could create, zero being unlimited. Like, it's a pretty cool option. Great if you want to have saves at a number of different places throughout a game for recording or some other various purpose that you might think of. Next up, frame throttle. So if you want to enable a rewind function, you could do so here. Next, you could set how many frames to rewind per step. So you could set this all the way up to full 60 frames, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, all the way up to 32,768 frames per step. Personally, that's a bit extreme, so I like to set this around 5-ish, but then you can set the buffer size here in megabytes, so let's go with 500 megabytes for rewind buffer size, and then you can change the buffer size step. But enabling rewind does cause a performance hit, so if you don't want to have any performance impact on your games, probably best not to use this. But then you can set the fast forward rate here as well, slow motion rate. And then enable G-Sync or FreeSync again if you haven't already. Next up, on-screen display. On-screen notifications. If you don't want to have those notifications pop up in the bottom left of your screen, you can disable them here. User interface. Menu item visibility might be of interest to some of you. So, for example, you can get rid of different things that you might not want to see, like the Explore tab. It's not really that useful sometimes. If you don't use favorites, you could turn that off. You could turn off image, music, videos, if you don't plan to use them. Next, accessibility. If you want to have text-to-speech narration turned on, you can just enable this. And uh, it will start uh, giving you text-to-speech of all the options. Next, achievements tab. So this will let you enable retro achievements if you have a retro achievements account. You can enter your username. Password can enable or disable hardcore mode. So hardcore mode basically means it turns off all advanced emulation features like save states, rewind, fast forward, leaderboards, challenge indicators. You can have an unlock sound, take a screenshot automatically when you unlock an achievement. But I love retro achievements, so I like to enable the option. Next up, the user tab. If you want to stream your RetroArch gameplay directly to different streaming services through RetroArch, this is where you can do so. So you can head in here, go to accounts, you can link your YouTube page, your Twitch page, your Facebook gaming page, and then again, Retro Achievements. And then you can also set a username here if you're going to be doing Netplay. And then in the Privacy tab, you can enable or disable Discord presence. So if you want everyone on your Discord to know exactly what you're playing, you can do that right here. And that's everything we're going to cover for basic setup. Again, there's a lot more to really dive into here. This is just to help get you started. Like Things like AI service, really cool things, but not easy to get set up at first, and not really essential to getting up and running. 
So things like this, I'm hoping to start covering in different videos. This is just the absolute basics at the moment. But once you have everything in your settings tab set, head back up to the main menu, go to configuration file, and save the current configuration. So that way, every time you load up RetroArc, this is what's gonna greet you. But once you have the config file saved, just go ahead and restart RetroArc for all the changes to take effect. So now when RetroArc is restarted, you can see that it is a lot more streamlined here. Not as many extra menu things that we might not be using, so really helpful. But one more thing, after changing your video driver, you can head back into the online updater and you will want to update your slang shaders. These are the shaders used for the Vulcan backend, so these are the ones that you will most likely be using. But with basic setup of RetroArc out of the way, let's talk about actually getting it ready to play our games. So most cartridge-based consoles will actually run straight out of the gate, you're ready to go with things like NES, Super Nintendo, N64. But CD-based systems and some cartridge-based systems do require BIOS files in order to play them. And BIOS files will all be stored into your system folder. So inside that RetroArc folder, there is a system folder. And this is where all BIOS files go. You have to provide BIOS files yourself. It is illegal to distribute them, and I don't plan to risk my channel because y'all are lazy to use Google. I also have a number of videos on my channel showing you how to legally back up your own BIOS files if you still own these original systems. Link to this will be in the description below. Now, depending on what system you're trying to get emulated, there will be specific instructions on how to name the BIOS files. So if you head to the RetroArc documentation page, you can head to the core library emulation page, find a specific system that you're trying to emulate. So for example, we could look at Melon DS. It'll show us what games are compatible. It will show us what BIOS files are required versus optional ones, what they need to be named and so on and so forth. And you could do this for any number of systems. So for example, PlayStation you can head in there. You can see the BIOS files we need, what they need to be named and what they accomplish. So I'm gonna go over BIOS files for specific systems in the specific core setup vids. This is just a broad overview to help you get started. But a link to the RetroArc documents page will be down in the description below. You could go through here, find the systems you're trying to emulate, see what BIOS files it needs, and go from there if you don't want to watch any of my other videos. But once you have all of your BIOS files sourced, you can just drag them into the RetroArc system folder. Now, some systems like PSP, GameCube, and uh, Final Burn Neo's High Score Dat can actually be downloaded directly from the RetroArc servers now. So if you plan on using RetroArc for PSP emulation, GameCube Wii emulation, head into the online updater, and you can go to the core system files downloader. And from here you can download things for Dolphin, PPSSPP, the Final Burn Neo High Score Dat, and a number of additional things for systems if you're going to be using them. So you could download extra folders for PR Boom, Scum, um, just a bunch of different ones here to help you get started out. You might still need some additional files even with these folders for these ad, uh, standalone cores. I'm not sure, I've never set them up, but definitely helps out. But with all the BIOS files in place, we're ready to actually get our emulators that kind of took a while to get to this point. I care more about the initial setup. Honestly, it's more important because that's the part that people have trouble with. But in the online updater, you will see the core downloader tab here. And you will see that there's just a crap ton of different systems and standalone things that you can download. So for me, for arcade, I like to use Final Burn Neo. Also for Neo Geo emulation, I like to use Final Burn Neo. Atari 2600, Stella, Atari 5200, A5200, 7800 is Pro System, Jaguar, Lynx, Commodore 64, DOSBox, Intellivision, Super Graphics, Citra, Melon DS, Same Boy, MGBA, Dolphin, Nestopia UE, Boopin 64 Plus Next, BSNES, Virtual Boy, Philips CDI, Dreamcast, Master System, Genesis, Game Gear, Sega CD, 32X, Sega Saturn, ZX Spectrum, 
Neo Geo CD, Neo Geo Pocket Color, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable, 3DO, and those are the ones specifically that I use and cover. There's a crap ton of other options, of course, so download what you need, and you're good to go. But now we can load up our content within said course, so one method of doing so is to head into load content, navigate to the directory that you have your game stored in, choose a game, choose a core, and then it will just load right up for you to begin playing it. And then if you had your Retro Achievements account connected, you can go into the Retro Quick menu using F1 on your keyboard. You can see different things like the Achievements page here. The Quick Menu also lets you change core options for different systems, as well as enable video shaders. So for example, we can load up a slang shader here for CRT. We can load up CRT, um, let's see here, where to go? CRT Royal is a... Uh, one of my favorites to use for a lot of systems. Shaders are totally personal preference, so you will always just go through and see which ones you like for yourself, but I really care. I really like this one, personally. But again, I will go into more core-specific settings in individual core videos. This is, again, just the basic overview. Now, if you would like to make playlists for all of your game content, you can head over to the Import Content tab. And you could either do a scan directory or manual scan, depending on what format your games are stored in. So, for example, if I head into scan directory, head over to my emulation page here, I could do a scan of my Atari 5200 games playlist folder. And it will find all my Atari 5200 games nice and easy. However, if I try to do a scan directory on, say, my... 3DO games folder, it won't find these correctly. So it'll do the scan, it'll try its best, but it won't work. So in this case, you'll want to do a manual scan, choose that content directory, tell it to scan this directory system name, navigate to the system you're looking for, you can choose the default core for that specific system. And then make sure you have Scan Recursively on if you have the game separated into subfolders. And if you're doing a system that you have zipped up, make sure you have Scan Inside Archives turned on. And then you can start the scan. And then that way all of your games for that specific system will appear right there. We'll do more about playlists and all the individual core videos as well. Again, basic overview. Another option for doing playlists on the PC version of RetroArch is to press F5 on your keyboard. And that will bring you to the RetroArch desktop menu. And then from here you can add in new playlists. You can make any playlist you want. And then just directly add in the files or folders of your games. And then you can also use this to add thumbnails to your games really easily. But again, we'll go over this in more specifics in individual core videos. Another nice thing about it is it lets you know if you have your BIOS files present or not. But that's going to do it for RetroArch Basic Setup. Again, this isn't meant to cover every single option available within RetroArch, and instead just cover the ones that you will most likely be wanting to run your games with. If you are interested in seeing core setup steps, I will have individual videos for each of those that I cover in my RetroArch PC playlist. Link will be in the description below. But as always, thank you so much for watching today's tutorial. Really helps us keep the channel going and growing by you spending even just a minute of time here on the channel. But now I do have a couple of favors to ask of you here at the end. If you haven't done so already, hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And also hit that sub button and notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Lots of content coming your way and I'd love to have you all along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping this place going and bringing this content to all of you. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.